Hey, my name is Alejandro Sembrano, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about stock market indices. I'm sure you haven't missed how much they gained since October of last year, and I'm betting you guys are curious to see what could happen next. That's what we're going to discuss in this introduction to a longer uh, PDF we wrote on this subject. Before we get going, though, I want to stress that trading financial markets is risky. If you are due to the market, do make sure to pause right now and read this text before moving forward with the presentation. All right, so who am I? Why should you listen to me over the next couple of minutes? Well, my name is Alejandro Zambrano. I started trading all the way in 2006, but I started in industry in 2005. I know I don't look that old, but yes, I've been in this industry for many, many years. I started young. And uh, I've been uh, a chief market strategist with various brokers before working with Think Markets and uh, started, of course, out as a junior uh, analyst as well uh, before being pro quickly promoted to being a chief market strategist. I've been uh, doing presentations all over the world. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, started trading in 2006. And more importantly, I'm a profitable trader. So hopefully you can pick up a few things by watching this presentation uh, that could help and support your trading. Okay, so here are stock indices. You must have seen this, right? Uh, it's exciting a lot of people, but as well, a lot of people are sidelined. They don't know uh, how to get into the market and they don't really know exactly how to uh, enter, stop loss orders and all that. That's what we're gonna try to solve in this presentation. But first things first here, let's talk a little bit about why we moved upwards and are we indeed at a new all-time high. I know that sounds a bit silly. If you look at the charts, you can clearly see we're in an all-time high. Here you're looking at the NASDAQ 100, and we can see that as when recording this, the index is up with 8.29% prior to the all-time high. However, what has happened since that peak here by summer of 2021? Inflation, right? We have had massive inflation adjust the NASDAQ 100 for the inflation we have seen in the United States, then we're actually still below that all-time high. We're below it by 3.81%. So we still have about 4% or so to gain before we are at that all-time high. And why is it like this? Well, because money in the US is not worth the same as before. And why, why is this interesting? How can we use that to explain why stock markets are moving upwards? Well, if you look back and if you look at a major crisis we have seen across the world over the last decades, stock markets act as a good uh, buffer, a good hedge against uh, inflation. Especially if you look, for example, at emerging markets where you would have seen the, their currency collapse with some 50%, well, usually the stock market would go up with roughly the same amount. Uh, it's an easy way to just enter and also easy to get out. So a lot of people go into stocks when we have inflation. So if we think about it, we are probably just going up partially because of inflation. People are buying into stocks because of a hedge. Also, what's interesting, the stock market, right? Stock markets, they are uh, part of the economy and the US economy from that high uh, in sort of uh, Q3 uh, 2021 to uh, the latest uh, reading for Q4, uh, sorry, Q4 in 2023, the US economy has increased with 5.5%. So the economy has grown over this period Stock markets, on the other hand, had a strong dip and then they moved upwards. And do you guys remember why we dipped? Why did we dip in 2022 and 2023? Well, because people were saying, oh, interest rates are on the way up, which they were, and that's gonna kill off the economy. But what have we seen? Did we see a recession in 2023? No, we didn't. What we, still, what we have seen is, again, the US economy growing and sometimes vigorously growing. In Europe, we have seen a slightly negative to mild recession, but not enough for the unemployment rate to tick up massively. And that that's the same in the on both sides of the Atlantic. In fact, in European uh, Union, the um, 
unemployment rate as a very low levels relative to what it usually is. And it's the same thing in the US. So from that perspective, the labor market is doing really good. And we also know that inflation is coming down. So that is the main reason why we're coming up. No recession, people jumping into these markets because of an inflation adjustment. But then the other bit again, the economy has evolved and it's higher. If we would adjust this and think about it, well, the economy is 5% higher than it was by the end of 2021. So we could argue maybe the stock index needs to be 5% above the all-time high. Think about that for a minute. That is why we are seeing people buying. So when you look at this, you might be, oh, I don't want to buy at these levels. Well, think about it. If you buy at this level, you're still buying at the level that was prevailing in 2021. Bear that in mind. Now, the other bit as well is the AI boom. So we have this AI boom and the Magnificent Seven. So we had massive gains in stock market indices driven by this AI boom. Now, that's a bit unfortunate to some extent because what's happening here is that some 75% of the gains we have seen in uh, the uh, S&P 500 in 2023 were attributed to the Magnificent Seven. And they're gaining because they are the companies like Google, Meta, and you also have Tesla. And these uh, companies are in a position to take uh, AI and transform their products for better. Google, for example, uh, you can use their tools to optimize your ads spend. Uh, Microsoft, as you know, they have uh, working extremely closely with ChatGPT. And in Microsoft now, when you load it, you get ChatGPT elements included, especially if you're on the business versions. So these companies can really capitalize on this uh, change we're seeing. And that is propping these stocks higher. Um, now with inflation, which I just mentioned before, with inflation coming down, central banks are realistically gonna cut rates. So this is uh, a bit of a technical uh, chart, technical image you're looking at here. And this is the expectations of uh, Fed rate cuts uh, heading into uh, December uh, 2024, so by the end of this year. So if you look at the very bottom here, the interest rates are at 5.25 to 5.5. That means that the interest rate right now in the US is higher than inflation. Uh, so you have a positive real yield, which is uh, not very common, especially not before the pandemic. Now, what's, what's happening here is that we're going to have rate cuts, at least two of them. So by the end of the year, we're realistically going to be around uh, 4.75 to 5% interest rates, but possibly even lower, maybe at the 4.5 to 4.75, that band. So we're going to be around those levels. And that, of course, is really good for the stock market and the world economy. Look at this chart. This is charts by the team at Top Down Charts. They produce uh, some really good and interesting charts and you definitely want to check that out. So here they have taken the black line, which is global manufacturing PMI. The PMI is a leading index. When it goes up above the 50 line, which you can see here to the left, when we go above there, that means that the world economy, or in this case, the world manufacturing industry is growing. And when the manufacturing industry is growing, usually the world economy is growing. So you have the black line, which is uh, at the time when they did this chart, uh, below 50. And then you have the blue line. The blue line is the sum of net numbers of rate cuts globally. And you can see here how uh, the blue line is leading the black line. And why is it like this? Because with lower interest rates, then your mortgage is gonna, cost is going to come down. If you have car finance, that's also going to come down. And if you're a company and you want to invest, then you can now do that at a lower rate. In fact, the market has already adjusted to expectations of rate cuts down the line. And that is what uh, we're seeing in these charts. And we do, with the help of that information, anticipate the world economy to improve. Now, with the world economy improving, that's boosting the uh, stock markets. And the stock markets move ahead. So usually stock markets move ahead so before we see all these things coming up and that for now, though, the way things are looking, the, the world economy will continue to improve and realistically that could uh, lift stocks even further. Now, what are the risks? Because there's always risks. 
So the biggest risk is that the central bankers don't cut in time. Uh, inflation figures out now in the beginning of March show that inflation ticked up uh, to from the accelerator on an annual rate is sort of stuck around 3.2, 3.3% annually. And that's not what the Fed wants to like to do. They want to cut. Heading into this year, the market was anticipating that we're going to see about six to seven rate cuts in the United States of America. Now the market, as I just showed you, is not predicting as many, two, maybe up to three rate cuts. And if it's a situation where the world economy increases, and inflation does not come down, then interest rates are gonna remain higher for longer. And then suddenly you get a bit of a bump, you get a correction in stock markets as they start to um, project that uh, we're not gonna have rate cuts. So that's one thing. Then we have Middle East tensions. That's influencing shipping. As you know, uh, we have uh, limited shipping now going via the uh, Swiss channel in Egypt. Uh, because of the attacks we have on the shipping lanes there. And this has, as you can see on this chart, sent shipping costs massively higher. So you typically would pay um, for a 20 foot container, some roughly $2,000, uh, but you can see here how these numbers have now jumped from around 2000, depending on the line on the route, uh, it's gone up to anything from sort of five up to six. So that's massive increases which we haven't really necessarily seen that impact inflation yet, but could come down the line. So that's a risk that inflation, in other words, just remains sticky. The other thing as well that we wanna point out right now is the US presidential election. So normally people get excited ahead of the elections. We do see some decent trends, but then comes summertime and things go usually very quiet as they try to understand what's gonna happen next. And if we look at the bottom uh, bullet point here, uh, Joe Biden would like to finish the job if reelected. So he has been quite straightforward and we sort of know what he wants to do, right? And he's also not too popular right now. So if he would be able to stick to power, realistically, I don't think he's gonna have too much of an influence and he has already laid out what he would like to do. So this wouldn't be a major change if he would, uh, be reelected. On the other hand, President Trump, uh, there were some comments that he said he would be happy to initiate the trade wars. You might remember that. So trade wars was a big thing when he was president the last time. And there's talks of uh, him potentially increasing imports on China. So things were importing from China, it would be uh, taxed up to 60%. Uh, now you take that money that would effectively uh, kill the all the all the imports coming from China, the ideas of but who pays for this then? It's the Americans. The Americans that have to import from China, they would have to pay for that. But then the idea is to maybe recycle that money into the system. But trade wars is generally not good for the world economy and stocks. He has also mentioned in the past that he would not defend NATO allies that don't spend at least two percent of their GDP on the military. That obviously makes the situation trickier with the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia. Another bit as well is that he has offered generous tax cuts the last time, and he might do the same. Last time we saw massive gains in the stock markets. But what happens normally ahead of these events is that the market starts to trade sideways. So if one wanted to trade, then the time is now. So what are some tactical considerations we should consider? Well, you're looking here at the CNN Fear and Greed Index. It's a very good index so you can find online just by Googling CNN Fear and Greed. And it pinpointed the low in October. The NASDAQ 100 is up with some 28% from the time we hit these lows here in the index. Now, the index is not very good at telling us uh, you know, when it's time to sell to book a profit, because as you guys can see here, it's been overbought for a very long time, but it's definitely good in uh, predicting where long-term lows could be. And what it is telling us right now, that is not the time to be long-term bullish in the market. This is not a very good opportunity. So ideally we would like to see this go down. And I use this in combination with the charts I'm gonna show you in a minute or two. So here's the NASDAQ 100. On the left is the chart that we had in the PDF. And what you can see here is that we have uh, the cup and handle pattern. The cup and handle pattern is when you have uh, the 
base of a cup and then you have the handle. You break that bit here and we can go all the way up towards uh, 21,260. So the market has gained a bit since we did the slides, uh, but we're still far away from reaching that target. Now, if we look at the levels from on the left here compared to the right, they're very, very similar. In general, there's a short-term uh, multi-day, multi-week uh, support level at 16,178 trade above this level, and the index will continue to go towards that long-term high. And sort of the nearest interesting support level would be between 17,369 all the way down to this level. Now, if something happens and we have a massive slide, then you know we might have a slightly deeper slide than, than below this level. But for now, given the way the world is looking at it, I don't anticipate a drop more than 10%. But if we would have a more bigger slide, then we could slide potentially all the way down towards 13,998. Though I don't foresee that right now, unless of course the world economy and the US economy just turns to turn, starts to turn bad. Uh, for example, we start to see negative NFP readings. That would be a very good reason to stay out of the markets until we have a bit more information. Here's the Dow Jones. So the Dow Jones index has a long-term pattern here at uh, 41,100. And we triggered the break here from this triangle already here by the end of last year. We have already done a good progress towards that goal. And I suspect as long as short above 36,978, this market will realistically trade higher and people will either be buying dips or in the short-term charts or using this big level here to continue to be bullish. Now, this is the Australian stock market index. It's interesting because it triggered a major ascending triangle pattern. You can know this because you have a high here, 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 and here. Difference between these two points is 181 points. If you take that as crap light for the breakout point, you go all the way up here to 8,730. Now this pattern will remain active as long as you trade above 7,333. Now what is the challenge here? Well, there are some challenges here because the Australian economy is closely connected to what's happening in China. And as you know, China is not having an inflation problem. They're having a deflation problem. So prices are coming down over there. And that is probably an indication that the economy is struggling far more than what they're officially telling us. Another bit as well is that the Chinese government recently um, established targets for the economy and the targets are the same as the one they had last time. And they didn't look to add any massive stimulus to their economy either, which suggests that you know it's gonna be difficult. But from a purely technical point of view, what this is telling you is it's about to potentially trade massively higher. So it's definitely something you wanna keep an eye on. All right, we covered some of the important bits and, and thoughts uh, that we have in the PDF that you can download from the Thinkmarks website. And what you can also do while you're at it, you can check out the trading platforms that they offer. Think markets, if you don't know about them, they've been around for many, many years. They are regulated by the biggest regulators in the world. That would be the uh, UK regulator. They are regulated in Cyprus as well and in Australia and in a few other places, believe it or not. Now they offer several trading platforms. We got ThinkTrader, which is great if you're on the go. It has some really advanced charting there that you normally have to pay for. Um, they also have a web platform there, which makes it easy to sign in if you are uh, at work or other places where you cannot install software. Now, if you do like the more traditional and the classic platforms, they do, of course, offer the Metatrader 4 and Metatrader 5. But you know what's the really good thing with Think Markets? Well, their trading costs are very, very low. They're one of the best out there. So if you are keen on getting involved in stock indices, trading and investing, make sure you download their platforms to get to know them a bit better, see if it works for you. I'm sure it will. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys soon. Goodbye.